Right. Okay. So the next part is building your spatial model. So how do you build your spatial model? So today's, uh, this model's objectives will be to understand the basis of normalization and also to apply these normalization methods and then to understand the principles behind building your spatial model and other various modalities. So first, I am going to start off with a little lecture, right? So this is a typical workflow for your single cell RNA sequencing. So you have your tissue, you dissociate your tissue, and then each cell hypothetically becomes a droplet or it falls into a single well in a plate. And then you do your reverse transcript, uh, transcriptome uh, generation, and then you have your cDNA, and then you amplify it, and then this amplification bias is reduced for those uh, techniques that use UMI. And then you sequence it off, all right? So the common problems that we encounter usually is the fact that we often forget that there was a lot of molecular biology in these techniques, right? So your reverse transcriptase, your incubation times, all of this actually does vary, right? And your cell types will vary. So there are variations in your capture rate, and there's amplification bias if you don't have UMIs, and then there's GC content, go on and on and on, right? And then there are library size disparities, all right, based on your sequencing depth. And of course, we know that single cell data, many of us would know that it is sparse. It's a lot of zeros, all right? And oftentimes, this sparse data is thought to be just a manifestation of the biology itself. Now, what's different about um, spatial data? So you have your array-based spatial data. Now, array-based means StormX or SlideSig or Vision HD. They're all array-based because you are defining a region, right? And then you are just creating a library set from those regions, and then you're sequencing it. Maybe not so much for SlideSeq, but for Stormix and Visium HD. Maybe I should take away SlideSeq from that. And then Visium and your GeoMX. So the principle is the same. It's just that your size of your array is just different. And then it's the standard sequencing by spot. Right? And you kind of pretty much have the same type of biases except that there is positional bias that we generally do not take into account when we normalize these data sets. Um, I know only one such uh, method from STLearn that uses your position to normalize um, the um, RNA um, expression or RNA counts, but no other methods. And I've not really read any benchmarking uh, papers on that because we really lack the methods that includes positional bias. Now you have your single molecule imaging based spatial technologies. So you have Xenia, your Cosmax, your Mersco, and then you have a whole plethora of very interesting name sounding um, technologies as well. So in this case, you're not creating libraries from captured mRNA. This is basically just pure, pure images of your single molecules. So each transcript that you detect is a binary call, all right, based on your code word, on your decoded code word. And there are things that you don't take into account as well. One thing is your optical budget. What's the upper limit of the optical detector, all right, of the microscope that you're using. And then there is positional bias as well. So when you do normalization, all right, Many of you would, uh, just a second, Javaria, the uh, Wi-Fi just went off on the, can you get help from me? Okay. So when you correct for these biases, all right, so we have plenty of normalization methods um, that have been developed to correct for these biases. So these are basically, you want to, 
um, distribute, all right? So any kind of errors that you get from your capture rate, you want to distribute it, all right, so that it kind of averages out. And you want to reduce your amplification bias, and you want to reduce library size disparities so that whether it is your low expressing genes or your high expressing genes, or whether it's cells that have uh, more counts as compared to another cell, everything is kind of evened out so that you can look at your data in equity. So I call this data analysis equity. Now the biases that are left uncorrected for spatial, I'm gonna go through some of these. So let's look at these. Now positional bias, you've already encountered one positional bias, all right? And I've given you this example. So your cell density will matter, all right? Now, one of the things that is um, going to affect or kind of, uh, I, won't, I should not see kind of um, emphasize this positional bias is your gene panel bias. So, when we design or when we use a custom panel, not a custom panel, a generic panel from 10X or from any of the, uh, what do you call it, the platforms out there, they claim that it will be a generalist panel, all right? But what is a generalist panel, really, all right? So if you have a generalist panel, the assumption for a generalist panel is that it will pick up some genes from every single cell type that is in your sample tissue. But with 500 genes, can you guarantee that? I don't think so. 5,000 genes, can you guarantee that? I'm not sure, so I won't answer that question. Maybe, all right? But the thing is, the chances are, as your gene panel increases, your coverage is going to be more well distributed for a generalist panel. But for those of us who have designed custom panel, like I said, I designed a custom panel for GBM. It worked on one set beautifully and it kept failing on the other set, all right? So the thing is, with, with that gene panel bias, and there's this paper that I would really like um, everyone to read, um, she has kind of uh, shown that you will skew the results of your analysis, all right, if you do not take into account your your design of your panel. Now, I'm not saying that if you really need to design your panel and you really need to skew it towards a certain cell type, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying make sure that you perhaps, you want to just focus your area of study, all right, on just that region alone. Or if you want to normalize and you still want to do a whole um, sample evaluation, Ensure that you have your other, what do you call it, um, other analysis or your annotations in place. Make sure that your cell types are well annotated so that you don't rely too much on clustering. Because things like clustering, PCA, they are all very driven by the natural patterns that exist. So if something is skewed, they will pick it up. All right? So these are some things that you really have to understand. So do not just translate from your single cell over to your spatial. So just think about this. If this is a Visium HD, it doesn't matter, all right, or Visium, right? But it's just that because of the nature of these single molecule platforms, you just have to be a bit extra uh, careful, all right? Now what about cell segmentation and diffusion? My cell segmentation will vary for every type of cell segmentation method that I use. So it has varied for cell posts, it has varied for MRSMA, it has varied for the Xenium in-house cell segmentation that I've used. Because all of these deep learning models, what are they doing? They are predicting the boundary, right? They're predicting the boundary based on certain optimization algorithms, all right, which is based on neural networks, all right, within these algorithms. And as fancy as neural networks might seem, not everything that is neural network works well, all right? All right, they are not exactly going to be efficient all the time. Now, closely related to the point of cell segmentation is the concept of diffusion. Every single vendor will tell you that their method will not lead to transcript diffusion. That's not true. All right, there will always be transcript diffusion. You can control it, all right? 
as our methods improve, all right, as we prepare our tissues, all right, fastidiously, like how it was outlined in module one, you can limit all of this, but you cannot avoid it. And it will vary by the tissue as well. It will vary by the site. So like, for instance, if you were to perform Xenium on the cortex, if you compare your mouse tissue, if, you, if any of you have done mouse tissue samples, all right, if you go and compare your cortex versus the subventricular zone, all right, you will see that there is a total counts disparity. And you can come and tell me which is messier and which is neater because the cell types will affect all of this, right? And of course, things like liver, the intestine, and the neater and the more defined your tissue is, you can also kind of assume, right, where your boundaries should lie. But for those of us who are doing cancer research, it's not that simple, okay? And then there is this thing with gene coverage. So it, it does matter. So when I, when I first got my uh, panel and I plotted my gene expression by the gene coverage distribution, so for sure there is more dropout and my gene coverage is one, two, all right? So then the concept comes about, all right, is, is my uh, is spatial really as zero inflated as my single cell? Because I'm controlling for my probe coverage. The more probes I, I get, the more I'm actually um, forcing transcription from that same transcript, right? So how is this going to affect my normalization? How is it going to affect, let's say, um, rare genes that are expressed? How is it going to affect my differential gene expression? Right? I hope I'm not scaring anyone too much. Okay. All right. So now let's review some of these normalization and transformation methods. Now, even though you have these biases, all right, there's one thing that I've noticed as a, as a biologist and also has, as, a, as a computational uh, scientist is the fact that in the end, all of your normalization methods, they are all just models. They're just modeling, all right, and transforming your data in different ways. So the thing is, when there is bias in nature, it tends to even out, all right? So even though you have to um, take into account that your end result and your analysis and your interpretation, you have to be extra careful. When it comes to choosing a normalization method, I actually think it's quite okay to actually translate the single cell normalization methods over into the spatial uh, realm, as long as you know that there are limitations and as long as you keep an eye out as the field develops methods to take into account the, uh, what do you call it, the um, other biases that is found in spatial, right? So these are the broad categories of normalization. These have been tried and tested. The favorites are log 1P and the Pearson residuals, which many of you would know as SC, trans SC transform. All right. So even I didn't know there were so many versions. So this is the delta method where your log 1P falls under. Um, it's basically all different versions of log and uh, arc cosine. Arc cosine is something that I've seen be used for IMC data. By the way, if any of you are working on IMC or uh, site of data, you can use some of those normalization methods you want to try. And then you have your GLM residuals, which are just different versions of your Pearson. Basically, you know, one paper will say that we are the best and we are the great, we have the greatest normalization method. And then someone says that no, a modified version of ours gives a better, uh, what do you call it, uh, resolution but it's just the same. They just vary the, uh, the parameters, that's it. Now for the others, I've not really used, but from my reading, they are not exactly very efficient. So I would stick to the Pearson and the uh, log and the Delta methods in general. Um, and I also don't have the depth of knowledge to, to understand if it will uh, mathematically make a difference um, in transforming the data. So 
Just to reiterate, the reason why we normalize or transform is really to ensure fairness in gene expression analysis. All right. And uh, we want to account if a cell was not sequenced enough and between the different um, expression levels. And also, you want to transform your expression in counts into a number scale that, you, that is reasonable, right, for your downstream uh, processes. So like I said, it's about equity in um, your downstream data analysis. And another thing that's important that, even, that I don't think about much, but I think is important is to maintain rank. So it's not just about rank in cell types. It's also maybe uh, you can think about it as in terms of rank in cell state. So for instance, for a cell that is actively dividing and then is going into quiescence, these are all different um, states or ranks. And there are some papers which complain that some of these methods kind of uh, misinterpret the rank. And how important it is, I am really not sure. Um, and sometimes I think uh, maybe these papers, they kind of think too much uh, because mathematics is one thing, but each of these mathematical models just remember they're only modeling one aspect of your biological data, right? Your biological variation is going to be much more robust uh, than that. So for the practical, we're going to test out three different uh, methods. So the log 1P, and then we're going to use the analytical Pearson residual method. And the reason is because it comes with ScanPy. So that is what ScanPy has. The uh, version in SURET is slightly different than this, if I'm not wrong. Um, it's just that one of the parameters was dropped in the analytical method. And you can go and read up on that if you are interested. Um, but yeah, I read the papers and I think it was just a, it was just a, a matter of making the model a bit more robust towards against overfitting. And then you have a Freeman turkey. The reason why I include the Freeman turkey is that I really like this um, transformation. They actually do talk about it a lot in many of the normalization papers that I read when I first started. And I always used to wonder why it was not so much used because it's really easy and it gives pretty much, uh, it can give pretty much good results, as good as log 1p. And sometimes, to be frank, I've, I've come to realize that the simpler the method, the better it is. The complex methods don't really give much more profound information. Yeah, so sometimes it's just better to stick with the simple methods. Yeah, just so that it makes things uh, cleaner. And uh, you can also understand, and if necessary, you can then use something complex, all right? So we'll move on to uh, the normalization uh, practical right now. Okay, so you just went through the really, really fundamentals of building a spatial model. So the thing is, as much as it seems like it's very uh, complex, it's not. So every single paper, they will use your coordinate matrix. You will need your coordinate matrix that gives you your position. And then you have your gene expression. So your gene expression, you can denoise it either with PCA, or you can denoise it by selecting for your highly variable genes. You can denoise it, and you can, um, what do you call it, uh, simplify it using an autoencoder or any kind of neural uh, networks. But the principle is really the same. And then it's really a fine balance between the two. So these are some classical, so there are three different classes of spatial clustering algorithms that you find out there. So the typical one will only have your coordinate file and it will have your gene expression file. So you have your spatial gene uh, single cell expression and you find your neighborhood graph structure. All right, so this will kind of fix the map over your, over your tissue. And you don't need an actual tissue image for this. Now, in this paper, what they've done is they've added one more step in order to clean it up. So what they've done is they have created this uh, hybrid adjacency matrix 
from their neighborhood graph. So they attach their neighborhood graph, all right, and they create these spots here based on how much of gene expression input they want to take in. So it's something like uh, controlling for the gene expression influence and the spatial influence, all right, because it's a balance and different papers do it differently. And then the principal component is that you will always have either a probabilistic model, all right, or you will have a neural network which will look at your feature matrix, which is your gene expression for each cell, which is a node, and then it will compute in, all right, your spatial adjacency map. And this will then give rise to your subpopulations and your Leiden or your, and your and your clustering. All right. So that's really how this is done. And in this case, there's no image input at all. It's just gene expression and my spatial. And then it's just a decision of how much I want to balance the two by having this weight here. And Spice Mix, I think, does the same thing as well. But they use a different kind of, uh, I think they use Markov hidden models for that. Now, in the second type, in the second uh, category of spatial clustering algorithms, you will use an image, all right? So it can be a microscopy image or it can be a HE image. So, why is it that a HE image or any kind of image is important in spatial clustering? So, think about it, all right? In some tissue types, your molecular, your molecular profile is always going to be um, more diverse than your uh, morphology or your anatomical domains, right? And the thing is, you have these well-defined structures in your mouse brain and also in your intestines, all right? So these are all stereotypical structures, okay? So it depends on, on what your thoughts are. For me, I believe that at the end of the day, I have function and I have my molecules. My molecules give rise to function, but my function is limited by my environment. So my function must be related to the structure that it belongs in. So that is where an image comes into play. So you, in this case, they create a vector of your gene expression, but what they include is that for each window, all right, so there's a 50 by 50 pixel window, and they move throughout the image, and then they compute the pixel, the mean pixel expression for each of the channels in your HE image. And then they attach this value, all right, to your gene expression matrix, and then they compute your graph, and then they perform light and clustering. So it's a combination of two, all right? And which one is better than the other? That I'm not exactly sure, but for me, I prefer to use an image to control my spatial clustering. That's because I find these repeated structures in GBM. And so I prefer to have an image to control and guide my spatial clustering. And sometimes you don't need that. You don't need that image. Sometimes the pattern will just fall, especially if you have a very, uh, you, have a, you have a tissue that has got very distinct patterns like the liver, for instance, all right? Now in this case, uh, in the third, uh, so this, so the third category of spatial clustering models that I have started, that I think is coming, becoming increasingly perhaps a bit more uh, rampant is the introduction of computer vision algorithms or methods into the spatial clustering. So in this case, Banksy, which you will use, so the premises are still the same, right? So you have your gene expression and you have your gene expression of your cell. But what they have done is they have taken into account the gene expression of the environment of the neighborhood. So they do a K nearest neighborhood again, just like the previous methods and they compute this time the mean gene expression. So this top uh, matrix here is your gene expression of your cell. But this is the mean gene expression of that cell's environment. And what is this third matrix here? You know, why are they making it more and more complex? So in computer vision, in image analysis, there's something that we always do 
is that we calculate for gradient of expression. We calculate for directionality. All right, because direction matter, matters, right? So this is a Gabor filter. So if I had shown you a picture of a zebra and I apply different versions of the Gabor filter, it will show you, it will highlight the horizontal and the vertical stripes separately to different degrees, right? Because it's the direction of the stripes. So there are vertical stripes and there are horizontal stripes. And in image, this is very common. So there are two papers that I know recently that have that have kind of leveraged on these computer vision algorithms. And one is Banksy and the other one is COVID. I did try COVID, but COVID will crash your, your server quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, maybe you can try, but not, not now. All right. But the but the intuition is the same. The intuition is when you take into account mean gene expression, you are making the assumption that light cells are surrounded by light cells. That is not always true. There are gradations. So you can have similar cell types in different environments. And the Gabor filter will pick that up. All right. So there are three different types of spatial clustering. They never move away from these three, except that some really have very complex neural networks. Yeah, they just denoise and denoise and I don't know what happens as they keep doing that, but I find that the simpler models have really given rise to the best results, all right? And this had no neural network. Bangsi had no neural network at all, and I was surprised that it worked so well, all right? So, uh, no, I wasn't advertising these methods. The, the purpose was really to make you understand the logic of trying to find the best model. All right, so if you have two similar models, all right, and they're kind of giving you the same general pattern, all right, just choose the simpler ones, all right, because you want to understand how they're doing the spatial analysis as well. So you have molecular expression, and then you have your geospatial topology. And many of these concepts that um, I'm driving in have already been done by geospatial and uh, analysts, all right? People who understand and study uh, forestation or deforestation, people who follow uh, wildlife fires, all right? These methods are actually used by them. We're kind of just using it on a smaller scale on our tissues. And then the thing about Banksy is that the reason why computer vision is important and you don't even need to use Banksy. You can use your own favorite computer vision uh, algorithm. So all those, if some of you use Cell Profiler, you can take one of the uh, textural analysis methods and you can categorize your tissues by the texture and then you can combine it and feed it into a neural network. And it's really all about what matters spatially to you. All right, and if you're discovering spatial, all right, then maybe the image isn't so important. Maybe you really want to see just organization on its own. Yeah, so non-spatial clustering is just as valid as spatial clustering, all right? So many of these spatial methods, they have been, uh, they're kind of annotated or they're kind of, uh, what do you call it, benchmark on uh, mouse models. And I don't know how to feel about that because no one benchmarks too much on tumors, but when something is organized, it's not a good benchmark, I think, because it's gonna work. I think what, what we lack is that we don't have enough of testing of these spatial models on other types of tissues, on other types of structures. You know, so if something has been tested on a mouse with all its distinct cortical layers, will it work on another type of stereotypical tissue? So we don't have that kind of benchmark or we don't have much of it. So just remember that when you choose your spatial clustering, mm -hmm. give ample time for you to analyze and see how it looks like. All right. And always choose the easier method um, 
to uh, to do to use. And then key questions you have to ask is what are your spatial questions? Like, are you only focused on molecular expression? Um, do you actually know if a pattern should exist? Okay. So one thing that you can do is that you can anchor certain uh, anatomical points, for instance, your blood vessels. So I benchmark everything around blood vessels. So if I can use my blood vessels as my spatial points, and then I don't even need a spatial clustering. I can just do away with non-spatial clustering. I just want to see patterns of distribution around my blood vessels. But my blood vessels will serve as my, spe my spatial anchor points. So it really is dependent on what kind of questions you want to ask. And also the nature of your tissue type, right? Kidney glomeruli, the liver, the cortical layers of your brain, they work very well with most types of spatial clustering. Okay. Now, differences between treated and untreated. So the problem is if you're doing a model or you're analyzing a Xenia model between treated and untreated, you're, because of the fact that your gene panel is limited, it will suffer, right? Even normalization might suffer. So just be careful that your spatial relationships that you see might have nothing to do with biology just because... Maybe some genes were missing or total counts just went down. All right. So these are some of the uh, drawbacks in uh, trying to model your, your trying to see things um, spatially. So start with Leiden clustering, non-spatial Leiden clustering before moving over. Um, so I do like COVID. Um, it, so the thing is, if you are only interested in understanding co-varying patterns of gene expression, COVID would be a good model. So COVID, what it does is it it um, it populates the spatial space with covariance matrices, and then you do clustering. So it's just showing, it's just calculating what's my gene uh, variance patterns um, surrounding my my cell I at this point x y. All right, and if you're only interested in how in all of that, I think COVID is very direct. And you can go online and you can look at it. It's a very direct method. The Bangsi is a little bit more um, sophisticated, all right, because they really have this fine-tuning parameter where you can um, kind of control the degree of organization. But like I said, you don't need that. You can use any of the computer vision tools, especially those who are very comfortable with image analysis. And then for cancer, for me, I really like Banksy, but it doesn't seem to make a big difference. So I might just end up sticking to um, non-spatial. So don't do spatial just for the sake of it. Sometimes it's just the way the nature of the tissue is, uh, that it is just that heterogeneous, all right? And then, um, yeah, these are things I think I have said. Uh, choose the method that is conceptually the easiest. And uh, it will make it much easier for you to troubleshoot. And uh, neural networks do not necessarily give the best results. All right. And so on and so forth. And yeah. And then now we will go on to the second part of uh, module three.